Hello everyone, this is Scott again with US Ignite. I have a, was gonna originally do an update for Docker volumes next in the series, but DockerCon was earlier in this week and they had a great announcement that do, native Docker for Windows and Mac, that's Docker uh, 1.12, uh, that has been released to the entire public this week. So we don't have to, uh, so anyone who wants to can jump in and try those native resources. I've talked about them a bit in, um, in previous episodes, uh, said that it's coming, it's going to bring about some changes. So since that was just announced, I went ahead and, and did install them and uh, gave them a try. And I thought I'd share a little bit about my experience in setting those up and getting them ready for uh, for use here on my systems because uh, they're really great. It's a great step forward. I'm great. I'm really glad to see it. So I think it's something you'll want to do if you're a Windows or Mac user. Uh, integrating it natively does a few things. First, Docker toolbox goes away. If you've used Docker on Windows or Mac before, you've installed Docker toolbox. Slightly different experience than if you uh, have been using Docker natively on Linux. And what that basically did in the past was, since there was no virtualization uh, for containers on, uh, on a Windows or Mac machine directly, what would happen is it would install a version of VirtualBox and run a small uh, Linux virtual image that the that Docker would run in and your containers would run in. Um, the the sort of the the biggest impact on people was that you manage you had to manage your memory a little bit more and worry about the extra layer of the VM on Windows or Mac. And often, if you loaded your resource uh, through a web browser on Windows or Mac, you had to look up the IP number assigned to the virtual machine running in for Docker Toolbox. And this was an extra layer of complexity. And uh, and so that has gone away in Docker 1.12. There's a lot of great new features. Uh, Docker 1.12 actually includes a lot of new great features. Uh, around Docker Swarm. We haven't done an episode around that, so really nothing to, re to redo. Most of the episodes that have come before this really um, are still effective, so uh, no, no retooling of the basics of Docker that I've put out there so far. That's great to hear. But um, overall, we, there's still some uh, still some considerations for installing these on the different platforms. And I just wanted to run through that quickly for my experience, at least for everybody. This is all new, so uh, no one having only a few days out with it, no one can claim to have have a really deep understanding of it, but it's pretty straightforward. So I wanted to run through what that experience was for what experience was for me, and it hopefully will be for you too. First, uh, Docker went Docker for Windows. Let's cover that. You'll hit the Docker page if you do Docker installation natively. Now it's going to the Docker for Windows page. It will tell you up here that uh, this is 1.12, and if you want a previous release, go ahead and do that. There are links to Docker Toolbox and Docker Window on the same uh, on the same page. But go ahead and use to get started for Docker Windows right here. It tells you, of course, you need Windows 10 Pro. That's a special consideration for Windows users. That's because it no longer uses VirtualBox on Windows. It uses is Hyper-V on Windows to do it. Hyper-V does not come installed on Windows 10 Home Edition or anything previously. Um, it does list Windows 10 Pro. Uh, I don't know if it works on Hyper-V for Windows 8.1 uh, or earlier. I kind of doubt it considering how hard they're pushing Windows 10. So um, just be aware of that if you're doing 8, Windows 8. I'd love to hear if you've tried this on Windows 8 and if what your experiences were. So leave that comment down in the show notes and I'd love to hear what your experience was with it if you have any. Um, Hyper-V obviously must be enabled. There's some, I'll let you Google around that itself. You have to get into your BIOS, make sure virtualization is enabled, all that kind of stuff. And once you once you do that, there's Hyper-V Manager, which is uh, if you're in your start menu, I don't think I have it open already. Um, that's going to bring up Hyper-V itself. Uh, you'll see, I have a HoloLens emulator as well, but you should see this Mobi Linux VM that'll start up once you install, um, once you install Docker for Windows. Now, once you go over to it, I had some problems at first with the installation. I just downloaded it, it was an EXE. I did go ahead, uh, read the README, it's always worth doing it. I uninstalled uh, the Docker Toolbox and uh, uh, VirtualBox from my system. Uh, th there are some problems on Windows. It doesn't look like you can have dual installs of do the new Docker and VirtualBox VM. I don't know if you can do it after, so I'd love to hear anybody with experience if you're still trying to run Vagrant or something like that, if there's any kind of collisions, that would be interesting to hear. But I know by the documentation it says you really can't do it. So 
I went ahead and just installed them all. The installed Docker M MSI is a single download. So this page pretty much covers it. Uh, it. It brings you up in your start menu here. There'll be a little Docker icon that pops up, which is great, lets you know Docker is running. Uh, the first few times, I don't know what was wrong with it, but I ended up with Docker, um, with Docker not being able to get an IP number. And I don't know what that was. I restarted my system a few times and it started grabbing the IP number from the virtual machine. So you might have that problem too. Uh, I didn't need to mess with any of the settings. It worked just fine for me. One thing to consider, however, is that it will run by default unless you tell it not to. So once you get down to Docker is running, um, that, that'll be in your toolbar. You'll, you'll want to use this icon to bring up Docker itself to get to settings, or you can go ahead and in your, uh, start, uh, your start bar here, you can go to settings and bring this menu up as well. And that gives you some settings about whether it automatically runs. Be aware it does run in the background by default. Uh, that has the, the real impact is it'll run with the assigned memory of the virtual machine. Uh, it takes up about two gig of memory. Uh, if you're you're sort of memory shy or you just don't want to use those system resources in the background, uh, just set it up so you need to start it manually and be aware that you'll you'll need to do that from time to time. You don't really need to do anything else in terms of the network settings. It actually was very straightforward for me, at least. Um, Docker works just fine. The one thing I'll say though, is that I wasn't able to access my Docker containers through my web browser by default. I actually had to go to networking in the Docker settings and select this exposed containers to local port. Um, other than that, every I, I did test all of the Docker demonstrations that I did as part of the tutorials previously. They all work just fine. So you should be able to work with that uh, with no continue problem. So Docker, uh, so if, I, if I'm in this uh, directory, do Docker compose up, that'll bring up, uh-oh, Docker compose up. I spelled it wrong. Docker composer, sorry, helps if I spell it right. Uh, Docker compose up is gonna bring up um, this works with the same network drivers as before, creates the VM as I didn't do it as demonized, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to shut it down in a second anyway. Um, so now instead of using the, the IP number for the virtual machine in, uh, with Docker toolboxes before, I can directly access it through localhost. So you can see uh, I bring up this instance uh, and it brings it up just fine. And I can do things like scale out of Docker Compose and sort of all those things just fine. So works fine with all the images I, I've seen, and that is really th that's thrilling for me. I really love it. Um, so the um, I'm going to clean up these these containers. Um, so that was great. It really works well for me and I was happy to see that. Um, no other real considerations on Windows uh, other than if you want to manage your, your VM member to shut down, uh, to, to have Docker not start by default. If you don't want it to take up those system resources, uh, you can go, it's one of these things, I think general automatically start Docker when you log in. I selected that uh, to, to not be the case because uh, I don't want to take up those resources. So it's something you can, you can decide to do. Um, there's a great page and Hyper-V if you want to on the Docker site as well. If you want to do a bunch of different options around uh, setting disk size and a whole bunch of other Hyper-V uh, configuration problems, it will manage that Linux um, virtual image in Hyper-V for you through these commands. So it's it's pretty easy to do. Uh, Docker machine still exists if you want to create a separate slice and assign it an IP number and all that stuff. Uh, but that's just sort of advanced techniques and just getting it installed and running. Uh, none of that is really relevant to it. So I'm not going to bother with it. Um, over on uh, Mac, I did the same thing. So uh, Docker, I should have gone to this directory before, sorry. And Docker tutorials, the NSQ, and Docker compose up. Um, so that will work just as uh, the last one did. This is the exact same Docker compose file. Uh, if I go back, let's bring up uh, what we got here. So. Look, same thing, local host. I will say on Mac, I did not have to, um, I did not have to enable localhost. So that's one of the differences, at least for me, between the uh, the Mac version, the Mac native install and the Windows native install. Another thing that comes out is you get this nice little Docker um, Docker icon in your in your bar at the top. So you can access some of the similar things you just saw over in Windows. Uh, that's very useful. Uh, I think that was great. It also, um, 
Docker tool, it, it has the same sort of install that you would expect from Docker Toolbox previously. So while as Linux clients don't by default come thing come with things like Docker Compose and so forth, uh, the, this install for Windows and Mac come with Docker Compose. It comes with Docker, uh, I believe it comes with Docker Swarm, although I haven't tried it yet. yet. Um, and sort of all the other Docker, uh, Docker bells and whistles as well as kinematic and so forth like that. So that's all included. I will say the one difference I did on my Mac install is that I did uninstall Docker completely beforehand. According to the uh, Mac install instructions, it will um, it, it it tells you to leave the, most of those tools in place first. Um, I didn't. I went ahead and uninstalled them. You can Google for the how to uninstall them. It's a little bit more complex than Windows because you end up having to root out sort of bin uh, user share bin files and a few things like that. Um, but it's really not that bad. It, I, I liked it because I didn't have anything running on it in production, and it, I just like to clean the system out before I go ahead and do it. Um, be aware you need a Mac that's newer than 2010. Um, and a few other considerations about how much memory you have and sort of what uh, what OS version it's running, that kind of stuff. It does work in conjunction with VirtualBox, so check your version as per the directions on this page here. That might get updated over time, so I'm not going to bother including that here. But uh, yeah, it worked fine. I, I mean, I'm really excited about this. Um, you know, this is a great development for, for all, all sorts of users out there. I love to see this kind of cooperation between the, the major OS vendors and Docker. Uh, again, as I mentioned in all my previous Previous episodes, Docker is aggressively updated. Uh, there's some new considerations around Docker Swarm, and I'll get to to that in some of the future episodes. I'm really excited about that, actually. Uh, I think that's going to be really it, well. We'll get to the features. If you haven't watched DockerCon, there's a lot new about sort of uh, getting up, managing your environment and your services in the newest version of Docker. That is incredibly exciting. Docker sort of has arrived at this at this place everyone hoped it would and when you really think about it it's done it inside of really two years i mean it's been around for a little longer than that but it's really arrived at that point within two years which is an amazing feat an amazing feat so Big kudos to everyone over at the Docker team for working hard on that. Big kudos for all the OS vendors, Microsoft and Mac, for working nicely with Docker on these issues and recognizing that this is really a, a, a big future push for us. They did announce as well beta programs for AWS and uh, Azure native Docker as well. Um, so that's going to mimic, I think, the rollout of Windows and Mac, which is really, again, very, very exciting. Um, the implications for cloud providers there are, are large, but it, I don't know how to actually comment on it because I, I would love to see more support than just sort of those two major vendors, but you have to start somewhere, so fair enough. And we need to put out some standards for other cloud vendors to sort of catch up with. So whether you're, you know, sort of Cloud Lab or Linode or Rackspace or something like that, it, it would be nice to have sort of those native cloud servers as well. But I, I think this is just a first step, and I think we're going to see those in time. Uh, that said, it works just fine on those cloud vendors anyway. Um, just some of the sort of extra features, maybe not, not there right away. So um, so great development. Docker 1.12 is really a fantastic step forward. It looks mostly backwards compatible. You really do in, uh, want to use version 2 when you use Docker Compose, which I think two episodes from now will be on Docker Compose. Um, and I will post the volumes uh, the volumes episode. I'm actually on vacation early next week, so I'll try to post it middle of next week or something like that. Volumes, it's a small issue, but there's a number of considerations. Uh, you can get a lot of uh, volume bloat on your system if you don't manage that well. So I will do an episode about that next week, and I'm excited to do so. Uh, until then, though, enjoy this week. I hope this episode sort of gives you a clue of, uh, of what it was like to install, for me at least, uh, the native clients for Windows and Mac. And I really urge you to give it a try especially if you don't have a production system, get out there, grab that latest install and move it forward. Okay. Thanks again for joining me today. I am going to give this like a 0.5 episode, whatever the last episode is, a 0.5 won't be a full episode. And I'll put this up today. I think you have any comments, questions, things you'd like to see about future episodes, go ahead and post those down in the show notes. I would love to hear your feedback and your comments. I've gotten some great comments already. People say they're a little shy about posting it publicly. So they email me, go ahead and post it publicly. Let's get a community going. And I I would love to hear from you. All right. So until next episode, take care and I will see you soon.